Wow. You all know what this is, right? Who can tell me? No pressure. <laughs> yes, it's just a regular ballpoint pen. I bought it for less than a euro. Americans tend to call it by the brand name Bic. The Britons call it a biro. Lajlo Biro, a Hungarian journalist, usually gets a credit for its invention. But the truth is, he was building on the work of someone else, a man called John Laut. Laszlo Bayro wasn't working in isolation either. He got a lot of help from his brother, a chemist. And the two brothers only began to enjoy commercial success outside of Europe, thanks to a friend in Buenos Aires. Then, in the 1950s, the Bayro was licensed in the US, thanks to Marcel Bich, that is Bich. Biros like this one remind us of the vital importance of collective effort, even when it comes to basic everyday items. They are the classic example of a collective achievement, the result of research and refinement by hundreds of individuals over decades, all to make just a regular ballpoint pen that costs less than a euro, and of course has a top that you can chew on when thinking. On our own, we can achieve very little. That is something that scientists have always understood, the limitations of the individual. Before I started to work in the business world, I used to work in academia as a theoretical physicist. If you ever want to remind yourself that you're just a tiny speck in a vast interconnected universe, I strongly recommend studying theoretical physics but I won't talk about that. The limitations of the individual. Isaac Newton put it quite succinctly when he stated, if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. On our own, we are dwarfs, but if we climb onto the shoulders of giants, we can sometimes just about see over the horizon. The problem is our challenges are growing bigger and bigger. After my PhD, I used to work at the Los Alamos National Laboratory that the US institution created during the Second World War to design nuclear weapons. My own work was rather more modest, but nevertheless still exciting. I was studying urban transportation networks. The kind of question we were dealing with back then was how the design of road network impacts where people live and work. We used to the lab's vast computational resources to model scenarios pretty much like in the computer game SimCity, but for real cities and with real data. That was quite a step back then. But today, the challenge is much more complex. Back then, it was modeling how cars and individuals move through road networks. Today, it is sustainable mobility, a multifaceted challenge requiring an integrated view across different areas, such as transportation infrastructure, environmental research, and social science. One might think that the greater the consequences, the more likely we are to try to solve any given problem collectively. But we see over and over again that this is not the case. So before we can ask how we can manage and master our challenges of today and tomorrow, we first need to understand why we are failing to act collectively to try to find answers to those challenges. There are certainly many reasons for that. One of the chief ones, I believe, is that we are standing in our own way. Human psychology can be a tremendous barrier to progress. Back in 2007, I got my first role of real responsibility in a larger organization, working for a travel company in their office near Amsterdam. Finally, I had a real shot at putting my ideas into practice. Part of my job was 
to develop a new way to price hotel rooms and airfares. I spent weeks number crunching before I finally came up with my solution, a thing of beauty that captured all the available historical data in a single, deliciously complicated forecasting model. My time had come, well, I thought. This was my moment of glory, my chance to shine in front of my colleagues, to receive the recognition that I truly deserved. Not long afterwards, the news headlines ran. Protests in Tunisia, political turmoil in Egypt. Tourism co collapsed, and my meticulously thought through long-term forecasting model turned out to be plain useless. And of course it wasn't political turmoil that made my model useless. It was my ego. I had been working away on my own, oblivious to the outside world. And worse, I should have known better than thinking that I could do it on my own. After all, I had studied the dynamics and the power of various sorts of networks during my time in academia, and yet my ego led me astray. My work was transformed when I put my pride aside and started to draw on my network. Only when I made sure that my team members were able to respond to shifts they saw in the market, each from their own perspective and with their own experiences, we could finally start to develop a solution that was able to reflect the world around us and deliver results. Of course, engaging with different people can be challenging, and yes, especially for us nerdy types. Uh, by the way, what's the difference between an introverted and an extroverted physicist? The introverted physicist looks at his feet while talking to you. The extroverted physicist looks at your feet while talking to you. <laughs> I, I am somewhat tempted to move on and share what the theoretical physicist does, and, and I was advised to share personal stories, but, but uh, quite frankly, that's maybe a bit too personal and might be also slightly besides the point. Um, my point is, working as a member and a part of a collective means embracing different personalities, which means stepping out of our comfort zone. Actually, blaming everything on human nature doesn't get us very far. We are the way we are for a reason. I believe that we need to view the peculiarities of our human traits, not as design flaws, but as design challenges. What would, for instance, happen if we build structures that allow our hardwired human traits to be part of the solution, not the problem. The lesson I learned working for the travel company in the Netherlands got me thinking about organizations. What makes organizations work? What stopped them working? And how can we design better organizations? For more than 20 years now, I've been dealing with all sorts of organizations, um, startups, uh, large corporations, private companies, nonprofits. I have advised, started, and led businesses. My work has shown me that our true power lies in harnessing our combined energy, our collective intelligence. It lies in being part of something greater than us, a member of a network. Sometimes this means being a small cog in a very big wheel. That brings me back to my earlier question. How can we master complex challenges? We need to build smart networks. Building smart networks is the only way to tap into our collective potential. Bees know this when they swarm. Ants know this when they build their living bridges. Even Hollywood actors know this. Uh, when they win an Oscar and then thank their co-stars, production team, parents, spouses, and of course the pet dog. Traditionally, we structure and operate 
our organizations in terms of vertical hierarchies, like a, like a pyramid with one person at the top and more and more people as you move down the pyramid. Building smart networks means replacing that pyramid structure with strong horizontal relationships that connect individuals across disciplines. From this to this. Take the mobility challenge, for example. Today, different experts in this field, town planners, representatives, com uh, transportation companies, policymakers, and so on, they are pretty much focused on their own specific goals. Building horizontal relationships means creating a carefully designed structure in which different experts can work together to find a solution to a common goal. I've come across many successful organizations that although they have a fairly traditional organizational chart, in practice operate horizontally in uh, cross-disciplinary teams. Compared to vertical teams, the lines of communication and the distances between individuals are much shorter. They speak the same language, they use the same toolkit, and yet they add so many different perspectives and experiences to the mix. That is what makes them much more effective. I'm not arguing that we should throw away our pyramid structures altogether. I'm arguing that we should build smart horizontal structures that allow people with various areas of expertise to work together to find solutions to complex challenges. I was talking recently to the CEO of a major online travel company, a leading player in the market. He told me, listen, I don't actually know much about the travel industry. What I do know about is how to facilitate organizations. And that is my key task. How to facilitate organizations. What he said was so simple and yet it's a fundamental difference between leading a network-based organization like his travel company and a traditional organization. In a traditional organization, the person at the top makes operational decisions, especially the big, very big ones. In a network, the leader focuses on facilitating and creating the right environment, translating to everyone within the network how collaboration protects and improves on what they already have. The leader focuses on harnessing the collective power of a smart network. So, what's my message to you? Forget trying to tackle huge challenges on your own, like a superhero. Do not try to do it in splendid isolation. Join a movement, build a smart network, find your tribe. The good news is that we already have the necessary understanding and the necessary tools to start to solve and work on our challenges. The understanding comes from science and research. The tools come from technological advance. What we must do is to embrace our collective intelligence, our hive brain. We must keep asking ourselves, what is my network and how can I make it smarter? Our networks are way smarter than any of us individuals. Remember that the next time you're chewing on your biro. On our own, we can achieve very little, but together we can sometimes just about see over the horizon. Thank you. Thank you.